Conceive, believe, achieve. This is former UFC middleweight champion of the world, Michael Bisping. Paddy the Baddy here. You're listening to Combat Sports UK. And you're watching Combat Sports UK. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Combat Sports UK podcast. I am delighted today to be joined by John Bogoslavsky. How are we, John? Good. Excited for the next couple of weeks of UFC fights. Can't wait to talk about them too. John's joining us in Canadian thanks or thanks Kevin. I was going to say thanks holiday. Canadian thanks Kevin. <laughs> so he has committed to the pod. Thank you very much, John. Um, and we're also delighted, as always, to be joined by Dan Evans. How are you, Dan? I'm good, thank you. As uh, I've not got a holiday away, but you know I'm here just just to say. Just another typical Monday here for us in the UK. Um, last weekend, the fight then it was a weekend mainly about boxing, but this is the MMA podcast, so we're not going to touch on that too much. Um, for me, I actually watched the BKFC. I watched as it was my first time watching like a full event BKFC from start to finish, and that sport is unbelievable. I swear, it's like just entertainment the whole time people getting their face sliced open and unreal what a sport that was but anyway it was going off on a tangent there in terms of UFC we had Brandon Royval against Tatsuru Tayara um it was a good fight a very very good fight in the flyweight division Brandon Royval caused would you call it an upset I don't know I, I did fancy Royval going into it but Tatsuru Tayara was coming in with a lot of momentum um to me, I think Roy Val won one, three, and five. Round three was one of the best rounds I've seen in a long time. What was your thoughts on this fight, John? Yeah, one of the better fights we had this year, especially as a main event, Andy Apex. It was really fun to watch because both guys were really, really well rounded. And the question was uh, Tyra has superior wrestling and jujitsu. And when Roy Val went to the ground, we I think we all forgot he was a black belt. Uh, I want to say he's probably like a first degree as well. But I think he's definitely he's definitely a black belt. So he went blow for blow with Tyra on the ground. And we saw what Tyra did with uh with Alex Perez. Even though Perez was injured, he went on his back and took some uh, took some big shots or threw some big shots and he didn't let Ra- Ravel didn't let that happen to him. I think overall fun fight. And could be I could be I would call it an upset because it was was you know everybody we thought the seventeen and 0. That Tyra would would definitely wins gets a title shot, although they announced a title shot right before their fight, really. But they thought he would be right. He'll be right up there next. He'll be in the top five. He would get Rovell's number one spot, and clearly he'll be the next contender for the title. So yeah, a little bit of an upset, but good on Roy Val. He raw dogged it. He knows he knows how to keep his position in the top five, and he uh, I he he was exciting when he came to the UFC. It was a little a little mixed up, you know, like he didn't like win against Patoja. Uh, he beat Moreno in their close fight recently, so people are like kind of like probably doubting him. But it's good to see him back on top and uh, see what he has next for him. It was definitely a fight. To me, this is what I always say, the flyweight division is a fight and fast forward. It nearly always delivers. You don't get as many KOs, but it's always just five rounds of pure madness, fast scrambles. I love it. And the thing, as you mentioned there as well, we everyone forgot that Brandon Royval is a black belt. And the interesting thing was it came down to that fifth round, really. It was two and two going into it. And mm-hmm. Brandon Royval, it was him on the ground that actually secured that round for him at the end. So it was nice seeing that. And saying that, that Tsuru Tyra, he was very, very dangerous on the ground too. I've never seen anyone be as good at keeping the back. He's like a backpack on you that you cannot get off. What was your assessment of the fight, Dan? Were you kind of surprised at how well Brandon and Royval fought? Yeah, I think um, getting into it, I, I had Tyra winning, but um, like I said, in my head, I thought it would be a decision. I thought Brandon Royval is very, very tough. It's, it's very rare. You know, you get someone, unless they're top quality finishing Brandon Royval. So I, I had Tyra coming into it, but I knew it would be a tough fight for him. The fight itself, when you watch Nick, it, like I said, it's a very... Two is two two going into the fifth, so it could be a very close. But I think Roy Val really showed showed his championship quality, and I think maybe it was a little bit too soon for Tyra. But I think you know that that round two and four were very very dominant from him, and I think it's, it definitely proves he is he's at level, he is top five level. And I think again, like the last where you know it went round three, you know he's a loser, but his stock still went up. I think that might be 
the case over as well. I don't think losing in this fashion to Roy Val was really stunt stunt over at all. So I think he's definitely definitely be up there in the top five, I think, within next year. And I think he's uh, uh yeah, he's still a good prospect. I think with Roy Val winning, unfortunately it sort of messes the division up again because you've got about the top four fighters all four there once, twice, three times. So it is a bit of a, a mix up at the top in the flyweight division. But I agree with you. With these apex events, you want flyweight main events, you want bantamweight main events, you want further win events. Heavyweight main events in the apex you should yeah, that's the, that's something anyone wants to see. So I think yeah, keep keep the your apex events, main events in under uh, even 170, anything under 170 is perfectly fine. I don't want any more heavyweight main events though in the apex. Anyway. No way. Sorry, no way. not just not just a main event, just any heavyweights in the apex. Like yeah. how the junior Tafa versus the Sancho. Ah, I love like, that, but you got you got to keep those on there just for any. Like, no, that was. <laughs> oh my god! After it seemed like the guys like just came off the couch. And not train for this. It seemed like thirty seconds in, and go both of them blew a gas tank and like couldn't fight. I feel like if yeah. Tafa threw threw those shots at me in round two, I feel like I would just stay standing. Like, and I'm not. And I'm I'm just five ten one eighty five. So I don't think I would. Like that was yeah. just horrible. It, that was a bit pub cooler. It was it like you know, two a.m. on the cobbled street sort of thing. It was one of exactly. those where. The technique, what technique, that sort of thing. No, so, I, know, I, I agree. I agree with you. Yeah. Now, I, it's always worth having one of those because you can see that you can see the contrast between Royal and Tyra and that fight. So you know, so it's a it's a nice nice range of styles. You can... A nice range of styles and a very big range of sizes, you could say. Um, <laughs> So, obviously, as you mentioned there, Dan, the flyweight title picture is getting pretty congested. You have Elmir Albazi taking on Brandon Moreno. Kai Cara France, of course, got the good win over Steve Ursic. And then there's a title fight at 310, which we'll touch on just shortly. But what's next for Brandon Roy Valley and after he picks up that win? Kai Cara France is there, but he's already beat him. What do you think, John? What, what, what fight's jumping out at you for him? I think... I think Roval put him in the best position because he keeps his number one ranked and he is the first person to to beat his matchup, right? Kind of, because we have Moreno and Obazi coming up in two weeks and you see Edmonton. And he, so I think Roval kind of lied in his post-fight speech. He said he beat everybody in top five. He hasn't beaten Amir Obazi. Am I correct? I don't think they ever fight, fought each other. So there's, no, there's never fought. Never fought each other. Obviously, we have Roy Val uh, versus uh, Kaya Sura. That's his name, Kaya Sura? I can't remember. Uh, uh, Kaya Asakura? Asakura, yes, yes. Ask. Kaya Asakura. Um, I think Roy Val is the best position. He definitely is going to be either f- facing Pantoja, if Pantoja wins, because their title fight now has been, they fought in December of two years ago now. Not last December, but two Decembers ago now, right? If I'm not mistaken. So I believe I it was December 2023. I think it was this. Oh, so yeah, last year. Last December, yeah. And then Pantoja is fighting this year. So the next fight would be in 2025. Enough time has passed. Pan- Roy Val did his dues by beating Moreno, beating. Uh, he's, already, he's already been beat twice by Pantoja, but. He's been twice now? Twice? Yeah, he's two. been twice. I think a third time you might give it to him. There's nobody a flyweight that really, if really you want to do like a number one contender type fight, you give him Kai Kara France, even though you already beat him. But it was an exciting fight as long as it lasted in round one. Yeah. The spinning back elbow, you might give him that, and then the winner gets a title shot. You give him, if Abazi wins, I feel like he'll get a title shot next and they'll wait him out till after December. Um, but I think he really put himself in the best position possible by winning. But he has a lot of options. I I don't think if you see his 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 body of work, that people would be terribly mad if they give a third fight with Pantoja. But obviously, I think everybody wants as uh Kai to win against Pantoja because then you have a new new champion and you have all literally everybody in the top fifteen nobody faced him. So then you could one by one go up Ravel, Albazi, 
Kai Kara France. But I think Ravel's in a good spot, no matter what. What's your thoughts, Dan? Do you think the third fight is there? Does it have potential with Pantoja for Rival? I think with... I, I mean, I'll touch on it later on when we talk about 310 bad in Pantoja because I've got a feeling he's not going to be around here the longer. So I think with, with Rival, I think, like, I agree with John, he, he's held his pin. I think he's in his best position possible. And he, he could sit out and wait. Like I said, December comes around... No one is going to happen in that fight. You know, he could, could be sit, sat out waiting. I have the feeling why he might not be someone who wants to wait. So I think Rival Kaikara France 2, easily uh, an excellent fight night main event, uh, part of a card. So I, Rival Kaikara France 2, they're both on the back of good wins. I don't see any problem with it. I think that fight, even though Rival won it and finished it, the, it still got fight of the night, I think, from when I look back at it. Um, uh, two UFC two five, so I think there's no no problem with running that back. I'd I'd be more inclined to see that for a Pantoja trilogy because, like I said, Pantoja is two wins now. I I'd, I'd like to take Kara France Roy Bell two as Roy Bell's next fight because I will touch on later. I think Pantoja might be looking at 135 pounds next year. Tyra. It's Steve Ursek. It's I mean that's a matchup I've seen on social media. Now I think that's such a great matchup. It's a uh, two complex. Both just had close defeats. I reckon you can you can throw those two together. And again, that's that's another excellent event. But like I said, we get rid of these heavyweights and we just just build these flyweight cards, and that's fine. That's a good good bit of matchmaking there. Actually, um, I think for. Pitsturo, Tyra, that is a great fight against Steve Ursuk. In terms of the rest of the card, um, bar the sheer excitement of the Junior Taffa fight, was there any other standout moments <laughs> for you, Dan? Was it maybe um, maybe D Rod getting back in the wing column? Grant Dawson got a very nice, a very nice ground the pound finish as well. What else stuck out to you? Yeah, I think um, if you look at the main card, Grant Dawson is like I said, he is one who got got a finish and you know a. a Pop level post fight, you know, speech that everyone seemed to get behind, including Bisping. So that was a, a good good moment. Like I said, when you get that chance on the mic, you've got to use it. So I, I think he did well. Um, but yeah, no, the finish itself, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good finish for Dorsey. He said he just come off being Selecki, I think it was, after he had that, you know, f- to now it looked a real freakish loss when he, he got chinned by Bobby Green within 30 seconds. So I, I think for Dawson now, he's got to be get back on the horse now. Like I said, two wins on the road. He's got to be looking at fringe ranking for your top 15. I don't think he'll get like a paddy fight or anything like that. But around that that top 15 at lightweight, maybe a, a Jalen Turner or someone like that might be a good good chance, good shot. And the rest of the card itself, like I said, Taffa, Taffa's fight was just, it was just one of those where you think, why am I watching this? But you are watching it. You know, it's one of those things. And again, with flights, uh, the Uzbekistani kid, uh, Timurov, mm-hmm. he looks, yeah, like you said, that, that's, that's your next prospect at uh, £125. And I think they could build him very, very quickly because, like you, like we discussed now, flyweight is becoming stagnant. And they're, you know, they're undefeated Dagestani prospects. They got rid of for no reason, you know. So, he, he's now over and brave. That's their own fault for throwing him away. So they've got some more prospects now. And I think, uh, yeah, Temurov is, a, is a, you know, he looked excellent in that, that debut. And I think someone who's just performed quite well himself in Ronaldo Rodriguez in, in the sphere. And I think him versus Temurov is a, is a great sort of tasty little matchup. But I think, yeah, Temurov, you could build him quite quickly because he looked, he looked unbelievable. Other than that, I mean, Sabatini got a, a quick finish. I didn't think he would have done that to JSP. Jonathan Pierce is uh, a good fighter, and Sabatini really did, you know, pick him up. And, and a submission, a standard submission always looks better. I don't know why. Mm. It just does. So it, it's one of those. It's, it's a great one. So, yeah, other than that, and then, then you're going down into your Taffer 
plate, so <laughs> we can skip <laughs> past that one. But um, Haddon and Carpenter, the first two fights of the, the card, they, those were two good wins. Also, like I said, they, it's, a, it's a UFC Apex card, so your first couple of fights, they, they're not ones that people are going to be shouting about, but it is good good moments for prospects winning, so I think that there's definitely chances to build those up further, but yeah, of the the main two, you're looking at Dawson and Tenrov, I think, were the two that really stood out other than the main event. Any others you want to throw in there, John? No, I think Dan spoke really well about the, the summarize the card. Tenrov, I think you could definitely fast track him in the flyweight division. You know, we literally saw Arsig number nine fight. We literally see uh, somebody who never been fighting the UC, got a title shot. So I don't see why Tenrov can't be in. Uh, in the ranking soon and uh shout out to grant dawson i think how many how many people you think googled grant dawson's wife after after the, after the post-fight interview but in all seriousness just actually, you good, just you <laughs> just me no no <laughs> I, I promise um just shout out i mean that's good good on grant dawson he has he's undefeated in the ufc with only one loss and it's to bobby green with like just i guess a perfectly placed shot by green so I think, like Dan said, he's due for top fifteen. He's like in his prime now. Something, get him top fifteen, right? Get him some, get him going in lightweight division. I think I feel like he'll have fun fights in there. For sure, for sure. So some more big news that was announced just before the card took place on Saturday night was UFC three ten, and. Las Vegas, Nevada is going to be happening in December time. Our main event, I was kind of surprised at how early they made this. Fair play to Bilal Muhammad for defending, I suppose it's still six months or what is it? It would be six months after, but for today's yeah. day and age, that is reasonably quick. So we've got uh, Bilal <laughs> Muhammad taking on Shavkat Rachmanov. This is one I am looking forward to, not because of Bilal Muhammad, surely yep. because of Shavkat Rachmanov. What's your thoughts on this one, John? Exactly. Who I think um, we're all back when Bilal faced Leon. I think on the pod that we're talking about. The only reason I'll be excited for his next fight, if it's next fight for the for Bilal, is just because of his opponents. I just want to see Bilal kind of lose. I just want to see him actually get challenged against someone who who will challenge him. And like Shafka is a perfect challenge. Eighteen wins. 18 finishes, a great split down the middle of submissions and knockouts. The men can do it all. Shavkat is probably the most exciting fighter in this uh, in this division right now. He is the boogeyman. I don't th- remember last time we got somebody who's up for the title who's undefeated with all finishes. And I can't remember last time who was that. If there was even one last like that. This is a dangerous man. I think Shavkat also took enough time because in his last fight against Wonder Boy, he he uh, had a broken he a bad, ankle, wrong, didn't bad ankle or a broken foot, broken toe, something like that, and he still came out and submitted submitted uh, Wonder Boy. The fight before that, he submitted Jeff Neal on the standing up like Dan Dan likes to see, and an incredible fight because you literally saw Shavkat could take a punch, could return a punch, went to deep waters. The fight before that, Neil Magny. Neil Magny is like probably like the gatekeeper of a ranking for the for the divi- for welterweight division, and he submitted him last second in the second round, I believe. So Shafkat is a dangerous man. I am really excited for this fight because I'm excited to see what Shafkat does. I'm just excited for a Shafkat fight and from the chance to win the belt. Not excited for ball. Not at all for Bilal. Here's one for you. Seen Bilal fans? Yes, they do exist on Twitter saying Shavkat Rachmanov doesn't deserve this. How does how 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 does beating Wonder Boy warrant a title shot? That is the maddest take I've ever heard. The guy's eighteen and zero, as you said, John. Eighteen finishes. He definitely deserves a title shot. Were you kind of surprised at how um fast the turnover is from Bilal Muhammad then? No, I think with. The like I said, that to be honest, the, the fight with Leon was boring. You know, let's not let's not go around that. It was. I was there, just silenced the crowd completely. Oh, I, well, I was. Don't worry, I was there as well, and it was a it was a horrible six a.m. walk back. So that was a that was a 
not a great way to end the night. But yeah, with with Bilal, like I said, it it was boring fight, but he did what he needed to do to win. So all credit. What damage did he take in that fight? Really, like there was nothing, nothing severe at all. So I I think the turnaround is like I said, I would have been surprised if he hadn't defended uh, before the end of the year. But to be honest, I think with the UFC, they they needed him to step in on his three ten card because I think the rest of the divisions you're looking very very much like there there wouldn't be another fight for the rest of the year. So I think it had to be Bilal. But they needed someone because Bilal cannot support a, a UFC pay per view on his own, no matter mm-hmm. if his opponent is Shavkat Ratmanov. Um, it's, it's just facts, I'm afraid. So, uh, sorry to the Bilal fans that do exist somewhere. Um, but yeah, that's why I think they were waiting for the Pantoja Asakura fight to get made and, and add that onto it because that adds in the the excitement to it. But no, I think I think for Blau it, it's a needed turnaround and look, uh, I'll be there when Shabcat submits in the first round. But you know, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, we can we can all hope for things. But no, I I think again I agree with John. I'm excited for this because of Shab, not for Blau. Again. Bilal's probably a nice guy, but he's been getting hooked on Twitter by Ilya, Connor, and everyone else. So I think he's uh, he's not had a great week, but hey, look, I'm sure I'm sure be be for UFC three times putting the best performance he can. To you give Bilal his his credit. He's never had an easy time. He's never been a fan favorite. He's been the decision heavy fighter that no one really wanted to see get the title. But see that morning, I was going to say that night, but that very early morning. <laughs> In Manchester, he absolutely ragged all Leon Edwards. I did not see that coming. He was like, done what Kobe Covington, Kobe Covington couldn't do, he done what Kamara Usman couldn't do, which just shows the levels that he is at. Um, so I'm going to pick a Shavkat win on that one, but I'm not going to back out of Bilal Muhammad too much because he really did surprise me. So you kind of touched on it there, Dan. We've got another title fight on this card. This is a really strange one. This is a strange one. When Kai Asakura signed for the UFC a couple of months ago, there was one saying it was the biggest signing the UFC had ever made, and that was a pretty big statement. Um, But it looks like the UFC also agrees this. This is the first time they've gave someone a title shot in their debut since Holly Holm in 2015, and before that it was 2013 with Ronda Rousey and Gilbert Melendez. He's a massive star at Rising. I have to be credit the MMA guru for this because I watched the video on that he brought out whenever he signed and he was looking at the views this guy's getting on YouTube. This guy is getting like between five and eight million views or five and ten million views on normal fights in Rising, selling out stadiums. And he's got his own YouTube channel, which gets millions and millions of views as well. So this guy is huge. The UFC know exactly what they're doing here. At the time they signed him, Tatsuro Tyra was main eventing against Perez. And that's when they announced the signing. So the fans in Japan see a sign. Go and check what's happening on the UFC. Tatsuro Tyra, another Japanese guy, is main eventing. And the same thing's happened here. So they've announced the card. UFC 310 announced that he's getting a title shot just before Tatsuro Tyra main events again. So they're really trying to target this. This and it's what Dana has been saying for ages. They're trying to bring in a more global fan base now. They're they're looking at other parts of the country that they maybe haven't been as exposed to, and that's definitely what they're doing with Japan. Were you surprised at this immediate title shot for Kaya Sakura, John? Yes, as someone who doesn't follow Risen, who you know partially follows Bellator slash PFL, who kind of watches one. Here and there. And Risen is purely Japanese. Am I wrong? Purely Japanese company? I think so. I didn't know anything about him until they signed. It's exactly. I think once I heard they signed him back in April, I think I saw a few of his highlights. Um, and I kind of just like... But I kind of glanced over it. I'm like, oh, they signed another flyway. He look, looks like a good prospect. He, you, know, you look at his record, he's... Uh, He's 21 and four, a few finishes. He lost recently, he left a few fights ago. And you're like, okay, let's see what he does. But I'm, I'm surprised. It's very un- unconventional for the UFC to do this. Uh, to throw in a title show, like he said, it was Holly Holm, Ronda Rousey. Ronda, uh, Ronda Rousey. That was because the women division didn't have a division, really. It was just like 
free for all. It was like kind of throwing in the name and then like kind of crazy still that this is happening. And especially after another Japanese fighter. So I think they're trying to set up a set up something there. You know, Dana has been trying to travel everywhere in the world. Uh, Asia has not been a popular target. Be going there, especially they're just going now to Macau in a few few weeks. And before then, I think they went to Singapore with Max and Korean Zombie, right? So they're so they're I think they're trying to go back there. And I think what's the biggest market there is definitely China and then definitely Japan. And I know Japan was crazy, especially back in the days of um, what was it called before the UC? Where you could do head kicks on the floor. You guys remember what the name is? I'm not old enough, John. Uh, oh, Rogan talks about it all the pride. time. Glory, no, or Pride, or Pride. Yeah, sorry, Pride. Pride. Pride was huge in Japan. I remember they were selling out stadiums, not like arena stadiums. There was like sixty thousand, and people were going crazy there the whole time. If you watch videos, you know, watch if you guys are really good MMA, really big MMA fans, watch pride videos and just look at the crowd it's packed to the max it's sixty thousand people it's three times what an arena could hold and it's not quiet for a second you've seen clips of it for sure of some old fighters there watch some watch some so i think they're trying to go back to japan and i i think this will be really good for for japanese fans and trying to go back there but overall just surprises Kai Sakura gets a title shot. It's very conventional from UC. I think I agree with you, Brandon. If you are, if you tell me the numbers are correct, with his how many millions of viewers he's getting, just on his YouTube channel, probably his Instagram too. UC probably is no does know what they're doing with this. I, I think it's definitely a targeted move from them. What's your thoughts on it, Dan? Did you know Kai Sakura before it was? announced from the UFC and it just kind of shows you as well there's there's always these kind of gaps that you don't know what's happening because this is a guy that's a global star in one country in mixed martial arts like a huge huge star and it seems like the western fans or the european fans like us didn't didn't know anything about him so what what was your thoughts on the whole situation Dan? Yeah I think uh, like, very much like like the both of you it's not a name that across my radar at all until you know that it got announced and i saw videos from like said from mma guru from plenty of other mma outlets that were like this guy is the the one superstar that out over on on that that continent like they're coming from ryzen you know it is a promotion where they've signed signed fighters from before it's not um it's not a completely unknown organization it's like your lfas your ones if you know ways players like that so i think it's a good sign of the UFC. I think him coming straight in for a title shot, again, it's surprising, but I understand it. Like we discussed, the, the top of the flyweight division is it's, 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 like there's no other way to put it. Like I said, Pantoja, unfortunately, has beaten almost everyone who's been put in front of him. And because of that, because Steve is there getting nine getting a title shot. Mohamed Mokaev was there to get a title shot before obviously what's happened with him. So I think uh, Kai Asper, I understand him getting a title shot because like I said, it's a, it's a new fresh name. And uh, I, I think I too watched that MA Guru video. So, you know, credit to him. Five million, eight million, you know, this guy is a superstar out in Japan. I think the UFC want him to come in and, and bring those views across and they will be brought across. Like I said, with Japanese fans, they are they're hardcore fans. They will... So I think um, I think it's a great great movement from the UFC to put him in for a title shot. Although I do he will lose. Uh, I think Pantoja is far above anything that he's ever faced before. Like I said, the, the force on his record. I think a couple of those are two former UFC fighter like um, Horiguchi and, and and names like that. So I think maybe a step too soon. Like I said, putting him straight in for a title shot. I think he may get found out. I don't think he's ever fought over five rounds at all. And the deal that Pantoja can fight for five rounds consistently. So I think when you step too soon, I, you know, uh, December is a few months away, but uh, I will be thinking Pantoja will be retaining his title. The fact that it is someone relatively unknown to UFC fans, the fact 
that his first fight or his debut as a title shot, to me that adds a real good bit of excitement to this fight because it's like going into the unexpected. You can go back and watch his rising fights and there's different roles and everything. I think some of the finishes he got was free roles that's not allowed in the UFC. So it's going to be completely different for him. We won't have seen him in this environment in front of a big crowd. Well, he has fought in front of big crowds, probably bigger crowds than what's <laughs> going to be there. But the, in terms of the global audience, we, we we haven't seen him. Do you think this adds like a different level of excitement to the fight, John? Yes. Because it brings in like a level of unknown to this. Uh, you know, like we're we're talking about him, yet we've never seen him fight. Mm. And it's not very often that happens. No, not rarely, right? We always you we're, we're always aware of somebody fighting and we've seen him either like in a rare case, if he is in the main card, we see him in a prelim or early prelim some other day and then he's fighting in the main card. We see him in a contender series. We might have seen clips of him on Tough. Might have seen him on Tough. But like we're all three of us sitting here, we have no. But we've seen highlights. We've seen clips of him, you know. But we don't. We don't know how he fights. We don't know. I would be. I'm hesitant to do my prediction on Pantoja and him because I don't know who he is. I don't know how he fights. Is he? And Pantoja has been through a lot. He's 35, I believe. He's taking some shots. I don't know how uh, Kai has been doing it. So. It's definitely this level of unknown and curiosity, I think, that will bring the fans to watch this. And I think people are going to be... You have to... I think he has to have a good first impression with the fans. He sucks. People are going to turn on him. He's good. He's going to be exciting. People will love him, and his second fight will be even bigger. There's a hell of a lot of pressure for him coming in this one, and you have to take your hat off. That's a ballsy move straight into a title shot. No one's ever going to turn that down, but right, it's yep. a ballsy move nonetheless. You know, he he could have been put in with a with a Peter Yan or someone further down the rankings, maybe a 10 to 15, feel his way into the organisation, but he's not doing that. He's going straight in. So I love to see it. I'm excited for it. I'm excited for it. It's a change, and... As we said, it's very, very rare that you get an opportunity. They see someone fighting. It's the first time you've watched them fight, and it's for the UFC title. So the other two fights on this card, I didn't get as... They're, they're good fights. I didn't get as excited because they were fights that we thought we were having on other cards, but they were obviously postponed. We'll kick off with Cyril Gann taking on Volkov. This is a really good one. Could potentially clear up to contendership behind Tom Aspinall in the heavyweight division. What's your thoughts on this one, Dan? Yeah, I think this is a fight that was very much needed and it's the right fight to make. Cyril Gann is, uh, you know, he, he's been in and around the top of the division now for some time. Whether that's been fighting or sitting out, it, it's been off with, with Cyril Gann. When, he is, when Cyril Gann is on, when he is performing, you get fights like you did with UFC Pass with Taito Avassa. You get performances like where you think this guy is, is unbelievable, but you know, the, the Jones performance really did stain what was a, a promising career so far for Cyril Gann. So I think that's maybe earned a few fans off. And with the rumours around his, you know, sort of, you know, not agreeing to an Aspen or turning it down and looking in other avenue, that I think has turned a few fans off. And I think Volkov now is such back up from, from, what, from his defeat from Aspinall. He's the, the second best heavyweight in the division since. Like his performances have been excellent ever since. I think this is a, a fight that Cyril Gann sort of reached around for, and it's Volkov's back back with him now because of the form he's in. So it's a, it's a great fight to make. And it's the right fight to make. I think the winner of this is is next in line for. Well, uh, <laughs> I say the Tom Aspinall, the interim shot, yeah, but. There is a Alex Pereira that lurks around the division that is always ready to go for a title shot. So I won't say the winner of this gets a title shot, but they they're clearly defining themselves as the second week behind Tom Aspinall. Yeah, and I think the the heavyweight title picture it needs cleared up ASAP. And I think once Steep A and Steep A and John Jones fight at International Fight Week, I think that will happen. What's your sort of early thoughts on this fight, John, between Cyril Gann and Volkov? 
Yeah, this is a rematch, right? It's rematch in the making. Um, mm -hmm. This is when Gon was like fighting four times in a year and just climbed up the rankings in the during the COVID year. He did take. He I think this is his longest break since he'd been in the UFC. And Volkov has been active, and Loco's been looking like a world beater. As of late, three fights. He took away all of Pavlovich's aura after Aspinall did. He, you know. Say he finished to Ivasa. He's on a roll. He's on a crazy roll right now. I I like this matchup, and I think um, either way, whoever wins this will face Aspinall. It will be fine. I think Volkov has been a few years now. He fought Aspinall, so a good rematch will be fine. And Gan never faced. gan has been ducking Aspinall, so it will be a good time for him to face Aspinall. However, I'm worried this might be another. This might be another interim title defense for Aspinall. I think John Jones is a Time troll. I think Jones, John Jones is a troll. He will not retire after beating Stipe. He will face Pereira, and he's going to force Aspinall to defend his interim title shot again and then retire after beating Pereira. Should Tom Aspinall have to do that, right? This here is a question that I have kind of thought about because this here is a scenario that, that, that's that been running through my head as well. Like, if Pereira does jump the queue, which I think is wrong, but I can understand why they would do it, should Tom Aspinall have to defend his interim title again? Or, I, I don't know, it's weird. It's such defend, a messed up situation. He, he really defended it once. Why wouldn't they make him defend a second time? He's kind of like a good look company boy, right? But Pereira's a star. And Jones is like pound for pound greatest of all time. So if they, I don't, if Pereira's like, give me Jones and Jones give me Pereira, I don't see why Dana White would not just roll around in money and give it to them. And then. It's definitely, I, <laughs> it could happen. It could happen. It would be sickening as a, as a huge Tom Aspinall fan. It would be completely sickening. And, you know, Tom Aspinall, shit. He's a patient guy and he's a company guy, but is he really that patient having to defend an interim title twice just to stay active? But then yeah. you'll fight a... Then you'll have a, the infamous Gon versus Aspinall matchup, France versus England. But it'll be for the but then, but then what the UFC has to think about as well is you need contenders for Aspinall whenever he does have the title. Mm. Yeah. Junior Tafa fought this weekend. There you go. Oh, we're not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I th I think Tom Aspinall, if if they skip the queue, he might as well see his, his belt in the bin and just go go across the pond and go to Saudi Arabia to fight a man in this weekend because he'll make more money there. Like I said, if they, if, I find Tom Aspinall he's taking the piss out of me a bit, aren't he? And I'm and the interim champion. You you catered now for yeah, albeit a legend, a goat. I I get Alex Perez a star. I'm not defending my interim title again. Fuck off! Like yeah, I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to PFL. I'm, I'm gonna fight Francis and Garnet. Twenty million or what, whatever it is. Yeah, no, Tom Aspinall. I think can at that point he's he's proved patient enough. He's he's done what they've asked with defending. I think to be honest, I think. Jones or Stipe, and then gets injured. This coming fight, then I think both of them might turn Karen Aspinall again. He's, he's, he's in a very difficult position. So I think it, it's, it's hard. I see the, the want for Jones Pereira, but it is very, very harsh on, on top. Big time. Hopefully it doesn't play out that way. I would love to see a Tom Aspinall against Alex Pereira. That there is what the UFC should do. They should see if Alex Pereira is a contender for Tom Aspinall because if Tom Aspinall, when Tom Aspinall gets the undisputed heavyweight title, who has left for him to fight in that in that division? We all have to start looking at Junior Taffer or Justin Taffer or someone like this. The other fight on this card then is Vicente Luque. He's taking on Nate Nick. Diaz, Nick Diaz. Um, 
An interesting one. Nick Diaz, apparently Nick Diaz last time out against Robbie Lawler, apparently he hadn't actually trained like for a couple of years before that. Um, I can't remember who it was, but it was a close teammate of his had come out and said this around the time. And apparently Diaz was in a pretty bad way, felt forced into fighting that time. And he's in a brand new headspace this time. A new Nate Diaz or the Nate Diaz of old is back. Do you believe that, John, or is it all bullshit? It is, come on. I think this is this is just to appeal to the old, old UC fans who are still stuck with Nate Diaz. Uh, seeing him as a strike force champion. I have no interest in this fight. I mean, I guess it's cool Diaz is fighting back. The Luke is on a big downfall. This might give him an advantage. But it's like seeing Tony Ferguson fight. You're like, come on. You know, you're like, just, just retire. Just we we want to remember you. It's like the new UC fans think Silva wasn't that good because they just saw him loss. Was it five in a row? You know, be, lose against Uriah Hall, who got cut right after who was season boxing. They're doing the same thing to him. The, the new UC fans will be arguing with old UC fans, like probably OG ones, and be like, Diaz was ain't shit. And we're like, buddy, you, you just watched him at the end, tail of his career, when he's not even supposed to be fighting. I mean, if Diaz comes out there and becomes a world beater, beats the break off Luque, gets a gets a classic Diaz performance, I guess, but I don't see that happening. We literally saw Diaz against Robbie Lawler a few years ago, and he quit halfway through second round, really, so um, I don't know. I don't know. I just I'm not too excited for this fight. This is probably the least exciting fight on this card. Uh, will I watch it? Obviously, but it's just, uh, just not a not something you want to see Nick Diaz fight in 2024. I I agree with you. I agree, and it's a very very tough fight for him. It's not as if it's like a legacy matchup or a le- legends right. matchup. Vicente Luque, he's got some great wins. He's got power. He's got he's got what I think is enough. They definitely beat Nick Diaz. What's your thoughts on it, Dan? Do you think this is a tough matchup for Diaz? Yeah, it's um, it's tough for him. I I kind of agree with John. It's uh, it's one of those I'm not really that. I'm keen on seeing to be honest that if you Nick Diaz is one for the old fans, he's a legend of the game. He, he is that Robbie Lawler performance might be this time I myself as a, as a newer UFC fan have, have watched him perform you know live and I you know I have, I've seen all the clips of Nick Diaz and he looked nothing like this you know this guy here who, who like Dante quit at the mound so if it's a Nick Diaz that's trained, apparently that he hadn't in the last one, if, if it's a Nick Diaz that's in shape, then yeah, it's going to be a good fight. But it's not a fight that really does anything for either of them. If Luke goes out and smashes up an old Nick Diaz, what does that do for him? And then if, if Diaz does go out and win against mm-hmm. Luke, you're not going to see a you know a surge for the title for, for Nick Diaz. Nick Diaz would get pieced up by, if you were looking at 170, Kim Buckley pieces him up, Sean Brady pieces him up, Ian and Gary definitely pieces him up, MVP probably even pieces up. So I think it's, uh, it's like I said, it's not something I'm very excited for, uh, but again, as I watch it, it's Nick Diaz, he's always hopefully going to be entertaining. Uh, but yeah, no, it's definitely a difficult matchup for him. I would have preferred something like you mentioned, Brandon, about a legacy or something. Mm. We don't really want to see it, but if Nick Diaz pulls off a wee Google Plata triangle from the bottom on arm bar and gives the gives the bird to the camera after, we're going to be singing Nick, Nick Diaz's name. So there's always that potential. There's always that potential. Moving swiftly away from the UFC, I'm looking forward to the PFL in Saudi Arabia this weekend. Then it's the Battle of the Giants. Francis Ngannou taking on Renan Ferreira. This is a good fight. What I want to mention first is Paul Hughes is opening this card. A massive, massive opportunity. He lives like 30 minutes away from me. I've watched his career throughout. And this is a big, big opportunity for him. He's opening the main card against AJ McKee. It's the first time, it's maybe the first time ever Paul Hughes is coming in as an underdog. Or it's the first time in a long time anyway. So I'm really, really excited to see that. I've been watching his vlogs and he seems to be getting stuck in. So 
fingers crossed, Paul Hughes gets a win. What's your thoughts on the main event this weekend, John? I think it's a pretty cool matchup. You know, PFL doesn't do good usually. And I think Adrian Mickey is probably their biggest star. Other than like Nganu for sure, but you know, Nganu can only fight one weight class. AJ McKee, we saw him fight featherweight, lightweight. Um, and I do like him. I think he also recently signed like a big, big contract with with uh, PFL Bellator and a lot of millions on that. And I think UFC was trying to chase him at one point and uh, Bellator just snagged him up, just gave him all the money he wanted, if I'm not mistaken. I think this is good matchmaking for Bellator. I would go for AJ Mickey. I always like the style, especially with his trilogy fight against um, Pitbull. It's Pitbull, yeah. Um, I think he was at the upper edge. I was surprised when he lost the first time. Um, I yeah, I think AJ Mickey. I'll be honest. I don't much. I, would I watch it if there was uh, no UFC? Probably. If there was UFC at the same time, I'll probably pick the UFC on it. But I think uh, if you like MMA and you like a uh, good world round style, Andrew McKee has nice striking, has nice uh, submissions on his on his resume. I would watch that. But uh, yeah, I think it's overall it's pretty good. I is it better than the main event of the UC? Probably not. So. Probably not, but it is a historic moment for PFL. I would call it, as a historic? It's a big moment for the PFL. Um, and it is a good card. It is a decent card. Some good fights on it. What's your thoughts on the Battle of the Giants, Dan? Which way, which way can you see that going? I, I, I can see it going, going to and gone. Uh, take, away, take away those you take away those boxing defeats. He's he's on a five fight win streak. He's he's beaten Blade, Scarn, Stipe. If you take away his boxing defeats before he meets, I think he's uh, he's definitely gonna be a level above uh Henry Ferreira. And I think for the PFL, this is this is their biggest ever cut. I think without including their PFL tournaments and stuff like that, this is one of their biggest ever cuts. Cyber Checo is a is a Big main event for them. AJ McKee is one of their their superstars. You got people like Rafi and Stocks who's on the island. So I think this is a a huge event for PFL and, and the good thing for them it's a it's a weekend where the UFC put on a a, a weaker sort of a, a fight. So I think the PFL can perform quite strongly this weekend. I expect them to get a lot of traction at the end, and I think uh, what they do need is a big guy and knock out in the main event, which we can all hope for. Another good thing is Saudi Arabia, perfect time for us. Saudi Arabia is coming in clutch here these past few weekends for, for us European fans. It's been great. Um, Francis Ngannou obviously coming in as the smaller man somehow in this fight. John, do you think uh, do you think Renan Freire has... Do you, he's, do you think he can compete at the level that Francis Ngannou has shown that he can compete at in MMA? I think it's an interesting fight. I think Will it, will it blow people's heads? I don't know. But these are two huge guys. I'm pretty sure Ferreira is bigger than mm, Ngannou, right? He is. He is 6'6". Six, six. No, he's 6'9". Mm -hmm. I'll check. Oh, yeah, check for me, please. But Ngannou's only 6'4". He's probably boring 6'8". Six, eight, six, yeah. six, eight. So he's a tall. He's really tall. He's jacked. He's Brazilian. Ngannou's 6'4". Bordering 6'5", he is a natural 265. He probably cuts weight to make 265. I wouldn't be surprised if Ferreira does it either. Is this a real heavyweight fight? First for Ngannou, because, you know, he fought Stipe. Stipe, at the end of his career, after fighting DC for a third time, kind of. You know, he hasn't fought since. Um, he fought Gan. Gan is, you know, you out-wrestle Gan. And gone, I feel like if he took a bit more serious, he could probably make that heavyweight. That's another conversation. Um, other than that, I, there's nobody. I mean, he obviously did fight natural heavyweights, but Ferrara is like a top top of the food chain to heavyweight. And what he did with um, 
Ryan Bader was incredible. I think it just looked funny him seeing him next to each other in the octagon and then just quick punch knockout, set him down, ground and pound. However, Ngannou has scary power. Ngannou has scary power. The biggest question is how has he recovered since the Joshua fight? That was a scary, scary knockout. Boxing, it was pure hands to the head. We'll see how he does, how he occurs from there. But it is an interesting fight. I'm still going to go with Nganu. I loved Nganu ever since his juicy debut when he had the uh, the the little um what did he have? We called him dreads, whatever. And he dreads. looked completely different. Yeah, he looked completely different. So I think it's going to be. I think this is the most exciting fight of the weekend. I think it's the most exciting fight until until Holloway and Tapuria. And even then, there's nothing to compare. Would you rather fight see Ngannou versus Ferrara or Jones versus Stipe? Old men fight or exciting tall heavyweights? You be the judge, but I think this is probably more exciting. Especially, with, especially with Jones tucking Asp- ducking Aspinall. So you like, we all know who's a real challenger. So there you go. And there's an argument as well that he ducked. Francis Ngannou too. I know he was yeah. bulking up, and but suspicious timing. The fact he came when Francis Ngannou had left, but just left, yeah, just left. So <clears throat> that there's a fight, you know. Like I know we're never going to see it now, but that's a fight I really wish we seen Francis Ngannou against John Jones. You know that if one of them had the other on the record, what that does for their legacy is incredible. Have you had to give us a prediction for the Battle of the Giants, Dan? Who are you going for? Um, gonna go. Yeah, I'll go with Ngannou. Like I said, I I trust his MMA resume, and like you said, he's he's definitely been a level above Pereira, and I think he I think he can get him out there. It's Francis Ngannou. He can anyone out. He could. He could Francis Ngannou could knock out a brick wall. He's he's got that power. So I think that you're looking round one, round one. I I think <laughs> let's let's go all out. First, no, no, I nearly said first punch then. Uh, not, you, yeah, first round, Francis Garnum KO. It gets on the mic, you know, he dedicates it to obviously the, the harrowing loss that he had this year. And in sensational fashion this weekend. Yeah, and I think the fact that he has went through that, he's been saying himself that it's. You know, it's, it's unleashed an inner beast with inside him and very, very understandable, obviously, that that, that that is the case. And fair play to him for getting back out so soon after as well, because I thought whenever that happened, right, that will be, we'll not see Ngannou now for, for, for a few years. So credit to him for, for being able to, to go out there and hopefully it does put on a show. What's your official prediction, John? Give us something more accurate than an Ngannou win. Is this going the distance? The, there's, there, there's no way this is going the distance these, these two heavy hitters. What do you think? Yeah, I just want to, yeah, I forgot about Ngannou losing his son there and then I think props to him coming back, giving, getting the motivation to do it. Absolutely. Round one finish, knockout, clay, clean KO, whatever. How, and I'm just Ferrer is going to sleep over two and a half over two and a half minutes. Sorry, over a half half a round, but Ferrer is going to sleep. I don't know if uh, Mystic Dan Evans might want to mm-hmm. jump in on this, but I think definitely. Um, look, every, everyone's pinning me off as the gambling addict. Uh, that's not the case. <laughs> I, no, I, I won't be sprinkling on this. Now. And you still haven't answered my last DMs for the last weekend. Didn't you win? <laughs> you didn't you bet on Roy Valley and didn't tell me? Uh, no comment. No comment. <laughs> we'll, we'll move on. But anyways, yeah, I think Nganu has a lot of motivation on this. He has the smaller gloves this time. He's not have doesn't have the boxing gloves. It's gonna be something of a, a familiarity for him going back in a cage. You know, whatever they call it, the smart circle, the octagon. Um. It's familiarity, smaller gloves, different shorts, no shoes. You know, similarity is going to go back to him. It's going back to his roots. He wants to do a big performance and got a first round knockout. I'll make that a hat trick of Ngannou first round knockouts. I'm looking forward to seeing him back in there in, in the octagon and back in the four ounce gloves. That's where he truly belongs, in my, in my opinion. 
So that brings us to an end of today's podcast. Thank you very much for tuning in. We'll have a UFC 308 review or preview next weekend. This, in my opinion, Max Holloway and Taporia is the most exciting fight the UFC can make at the moment. There's a lot of shit talk going in there. Taporia's mm-hmm. bought a BMF belt specially for it. <laughs> we are in for an absolute banging fight. Dan and John will be the ones breaking it down. I am off on holiday, so... I will not be here for it, but I'll definitely be tuning in the the card in Saudi Arabia next Saturday. And just before Cheers, I go, man. make sure like, share, and subscribe, and follow the Twitter, follow the Instagram. Some big interviews coming out on or on Instagram and YouTube and things like this. Combat Sports UK is on all social media, so make sure and check us out for all your latest combat sports news and gossip. Cheers! Thank you for listening. Cheers, everybody.